so we're talking about insanely great, and I'll try to go a little bit fast here. Um, the, the phrase insanely great comes from, I borrowed from Steve Jobs. I thought his products, while very clever, didn't rise to that standard, but the cypherpunk totality does. And if you, you'll see, I have to give Mr. Jobs a little bit of credit. He and Mr. Wozniak were actual hackers at one time, unlike the other big computer guys. Here in this picture, building something called a blue box. A blue box was a device for hacking the telephone system. Uh, it allowed you to make free phone calls. And these that was their first product, not a computer. It was a hacker tool. So credit where is due. And uh, that brings us into the hacking as it existed before the computer. And here you see their magazine, 2600, The Hackers Quarterly, which still exists, by the way. So these are the kind of people that became cypherpunks. If you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, one of the first images anybody saw of the cypherpunks. Uh, on the left is Timothy C. May, then Eric Hughes, and then John Gilmore. Uh, and there was a lot of overflow from the telephone hackers. Now, I want to explain to you a little bit about these people. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, what the mailing list looked like in the beginning. It was very simple. It was just uh, a news group list, and this was very, very early internet. Uh, but you know, it was a really wonderful format for us. We we communicated about a lot of things in surprising depth. It was actually a terrific forum for us. Now, let's talk about in the next slide what I call the discoverers of Terra Nova. And that is these early cypherpunks realized they were onto something unique in the history of the world, or at least in the recent history of the world. They had this new network, the internet, which was censorship resistant. There was no gatekeeper. Anyone who was connected to this thing could communicate. And it was a tremendously interesting realm. And then we realized that we had encryption. Strong encryption was coming around at that time. And then we got this thing called Diffie-Hillman Key Exchange. And it allowed us to share our keys with the whole world. Prior to that, if you wanted to have encryption, you had to very secretly share the key because there was only one key. And anybody who got it, could read everything you said. You couldn't just send it over the network. With our new public key cryptography, you could. So all of a sudden, here we are, and we've got a new realm, and we've got walls we can put around it, that we can be private, that we can have this new realm where nobody can tell us what to do, where we can build what we want, where we can be what we want. That was a revelation. And that was when people said, what do we have here? What can we build here? What should we build here? And if you'll see uh, on this slide, the one I have entitled The Discoverers of Terra Nova, I try to explain to you a little bit of who these people were. Now, I'm not going to be fair about this, but this is the way it was. Um, I'm not going to be complete about it, I should say. These were people who had a non-hostile view of life, who didn't think life sucked and then you die, who thought that you could actually do something in the world. Uh, they had expectations of excellence, and they were willing to pay the price for excellence. So, and I give their parents credit for this, probably. Uh, but that's the kind of assumptions these people had. We also had people who believed in honesty and fair dealing. We it really, we, we believed in the golden rule, although we didn't really talk about the golden rule, at least I don't remember it very much. But if you wanted to discredit yourself, you did to somebody else what you wouldn't like them to do to you. Um, these people did not respect power and prestige. That just wasn't part of the game. Um, they believed in reason and evidence. Uh, we were really educated by NASA and the hippies. The hippies were nonconformists. I mean, that's if nonconformist is really the essence of being a hippie in those days. Uh, and 
we grew up on that. I did, and I know a lot of the other people who were in the list in the beginning, some of them were pretty young, but we grew up with this kind of nonconformist is the way we are and we're going to be. Also, NASA, you have to understand what it was like to be in the 1960s watching spaceships go up into space for the first time in human history. It was an incredible experience. Uh, if I could give you a pill to, that you could feel that, trust me, I would. It was a, an incredible time. And this is the kind of ideas that we had in our heads. These were people who needed a refuge or a playground for their minds. Now, I'm telling you these people's virtues. There were also all sorts of goofiness that went on. That This was not a collection of, of pure saints. Uh, these people sometimes argued, sometimes were stupid, sometimes were vain. There was one point where the list got so uh, disruptive that uh, Sandy Sanford had to moderate it for a few months until things calmed down. Um, and the, the cypherpunks list was... All right, let me get back to where I was. So cypherpunks and, and who these people were um, with all of their usual human problems, these are the assumptions that they made that they embedded in code. So let's go to the next slide. This just to give you an idea, this is Martin Hellman and Wynne Diffie. And you see that they look a little like hippies working at NASA. They weren't exactly, but that's the kind of people that tended to come into the, the cypherpunks movement at the beginning. And as we go to the next slide, you'll see one of the things that they built. This is BitTorrent, and I'm calling it egalitarian protocols. That is, there's no node that has any advantage over any other node. This is the kind of assumption that was built into code by these people. Now, egalitarian code is not the be all and end all. It doesn't work for everything. But this is the kind of idea that they had that they wanted to, to, to put into reality. Next slide, we see a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree has no advantage nodes, it's just math. And this is the type of thing that, again, is egalitarian. There is no one that has an advantage. The next slide. Uh, is a Chaumian mix. This is a, an encrypted mix, uh, which again, no advantage nodes. This is the thing that we use, or one of the primary things we do uh, to create anonymity. Now we'll go to the next slide. This is why I say that Bitcoin has subversion inside. Bitcoin has these sorts of assumptions built into it. Again, BitTorrent, Merkle trees, they're part of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has these things built in and it's not really an attack on the existing system. It's just a different thing. And it just so happens that the existing systems, the hierarchical systems of the world can't really survive competition. So Bitcoin does have subversion inside, and it is money. And money has tremendous importance, tremendous power. We say change the money, change the world. And there's a good deal, at least, of truth to that. It's, it's not complete, but it, there's a good deal of truth to it. And I want you just to back up. Next slide. And I want to back up and just make a few points on that. And what you're seeing here is a relic from the ancient Sumerians. Uh, this is called a receipt or a or an envelope, uh, this large ball. It's a hollow ball, and it has writings on the surface. And it's for a collection of debts. And these little stones that you see at the bottom, those are the individual debts that are raised in this envelope. As it turns the system that we kind of thought, the way money we thought came into existence was we use gold and silver, and then receipts. As it turns out, that really wasn't too much the case. Uh, what really happened was that debt empowered rulership. Let's look to the next slide. I'll try to keep going quickly here. This is Alexander Hamilton writing in the early American days, uh, saying that is a well-known fact that where debt is an object of confidence, it answers the purposes of money. Transfers of public debt are equivalent to payment in coins. So when you have debt everywhere, as you did in the old days, 
you need a central certification of debts, especially when they're involved with taxation, which of course they were, uh, this greatly empowered rulership. Silver by itself doesn't need a central certification, and silver was always the money in the old days. Millions of debts do need a certifier, and this was tremendously empowering to the I won't go through details, but it was. Now, next slide. Cryptocurrencies are created without concurrent debt. When you make a dollar, you're also creating debt. I won't go through the particulars, but you're all creating T-bills, which have debt attached. And you also have control because the government controls the banks. If the banks don't play by their rules, they get shut down. So their cryptocurrency became subversive by nature because it doesn't have any debt attached. You want to loan somebody some cryptocurrency? Sure you can, but there's nothing inherent in it that requires debt. And there is no mechanism of control built in. This is subversive to a system that can't really bear competition. Next slide. Open Bazaar. Uh, you show they have this nice web uh, of interactions between people. Uh, next slide, particle, the same sort of thing. And by the way, please support these people, uh, Open Bazaar and Particle. Uh, they need you. We need them and things like that. Um, the free distribute. We need these. Next slide. I want to back up and give you some idea of how this thing became the dark totality that's coming upon us. Uh, I love these old illustrations. Um, they're a little bit flamboyant and sometimes not entirely fair, but they make the point really well, and this one does, that humanity has been harnessed. It is the rule over the, of the few over the many, and it has been for 6,000 years. It's the same model from the Bronze Age. You've got one or two or 10 or a few hundred, people who make the rules and every told that they will obey or they will be hurt. And this is the model and they take your money and sometimes they send your children off to die in wars. This is the model. And it is a real, real inherent problem. Let's go to the next slide. And I wanna show you how this developed because it pertains exactly to where we are now. At first there was open rulership and there's so much to explain here that I, I won't go through the details. Um, from 2000 to 4000 4, to 2000 BC, more or less, we had religious empires, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, and others. And essentially, it was a religious model built upon sacrifice to the gods, which of course meant sacrifice to the local, be you know the ruler or very closely associated with the ruler. That failed in the early 2000s BC. And then we got these horrible terror-based empires. You read these old ancient you know, inscriptions of, I had 14 nobles against me and then I nailed their head to walls and took out their eyes and all these terrible things. This is the era where this really thrived and it worked that way because these guys got to create a legend, a terror that everyone was afraid to disobey them. And for a while it worked, and then at 1200 BC, it collapsed in flamboyant fashion. And then we had a period of anarchy uh, where power devolved till it was essentially none at all. It's usually called the Dark Age of the Greeks. But this was a time when other things had a chance to thrive. The Phoenicians. The Phoenicians ha have been almost written out of world history, but they were crucial for, for so many things. You trace all sorts of things back to their beginning. And you find Phoenicians waiting for you. Uh, so they were crucially important. And of course, the Hebrews, who this is the time when they had a chance to thrive, when they were out from underneath power, and they got a chance to thrive. So, and, and they're critically important in other ways, but I won't go through that again. Then we had these kingless uh, realms, uh, Greece and Rome, very carefully, did not have a king. The Romans, when they started, they had a law. And they had laws, and if you had a problem, you had to go to the forum. But not if somebody wanted to make himself king. You can kill him right now. No trial, no nothing. Anyone wants to be king, just kill him. And then 
monarchy in most places of Europe during the quote unquote the people eliminated slavery. They're the first people who eliminated on a civilizational scale. And period. Uh, that's not really a fair explanation, but it took that sort of period for them to do it. All right. Uh, then we went into feudalism, which isn't wasn't near taught, and then strong monarchies, and then something happened. We had, in the late 1700s, we had the American Revolution, but that was far away on a different continent. Then we had the French Revolution that kind of went sideways really fast. And next, let's go to the next slide, please. And then there were a bunch of revolutions in Europe, uh, 1820, 1830, and especially 1848, when the aristocracy was pretty much kicked out. And that's not entirely true. There's all sorts of complications, but aristocracy was kind of moved out of the way. And very interestingly, this is also the time when colonialism began, where all of these nice elite boys began running things in other countries overseas. It was also the time where silver was demonetized. Silver was always the money of the people. Silver was the basis of the US dollar. A dollar was defined as so many grains of silver. But it, through the 1870s, it was removed by force of law. So it's very interesting how these things developed. And it was also the time of public credit and the time of democracy coming in, which immensely empowered covert rulership. When you have public credit, who's responsible for the debt? It used to be the king. And if the king didn't pay, the bank might go bankrupt. Well, once we had public credit, all of the suckers down on the farms are re re responsible for the loans. Every citizen is responsible for the loan and their children and grandchildren and so on. Wow, what can you do with that? How could that be abused? The, the hundred or so big bosses who sit in the marble house get to make debts till the end of time and somebody else has to pay them, the poor schnucks who work on the farms or in the, in the cities later on. And then you had democracy, which meant there was no one to blame. Before, there was a prince or a king or somebody to blame. Now, who rules? Everybody, which means nobody. And there's no one to blame. This was an ideal setup for covert rulership. And this is why we're getting into a dark totality. We've moved from democratic power to networked power. Um, I like to use the example of the credit report for network power. For most young people in the modern West, their credit report, their ability to get loans is crucial. But who's responsible for that? Um, we don't know. Banks a little bit, credit agencies, agencies a little bit. Really what it is is interlocked boards of directors. And of course, cooperating with politicians in the whole complex. But it's networked power. And you'll see this is the big legislative things of, of the age. Um, we have the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Obamacare and everything else. These are creating networks. So this is what we're getting now. And um, this is what is leading into with surveillance capitalism, which I cannot condemn strongly enough, is leading into this AI or big data driven personalized manipulation. And it's a very, very dangerous thing. But there is a little bit of good news. Go to the next slide, please. And you'll see that this dark totality as I look at it, can be broken and it can be broken fairly easily if people stop taking loans from banks. In other words, they're, they're not creating any more debt and they're undercutting the entire debt system, it weakens the system. If people start using cryptocurrencies privately, whether it be privacy coins or using Bitcoin better, um, the system no longer controls money. The same would be true for gold and silver if people actually used it in commerce. Um, if they begin homeschooling their children on any scale, the system of, is depleted of pre-believing workers. 
if people use anonymous communication, and notice that I said anonymous, not just encrypted, but anonymous. If you use anonymous communication, the entire manipulation complex runs out of data and cannot operate. So if we use cryptocurrency, if we use anonymity, the system has no choice, but has to convince people that it's the best choice for them using reason instead of fear, instead of emotional manipulation. So the, the dark totality can be broken and we can break it if enough of us decide to do it. All right, next slide. Now here's where it gets interesting. This is why I say this is insanely great, not just great, but insanely great, is that the cypherpunk totality equals accelerated human evolution. Now I know that sounds like an overly flamboyant phrase. I get it, I, I understand that. Stay with me. I think you're gonna see something tremendous here. Next slide. The fundamental fact of human behavior is that humans behave almost exactly like primates who have a prefrontal cortex that other animals. People describe it, if you look up descriptions for it on Wikipedia or wherever, they'll say the prefrontal cortex with executive decisions. And that's not incorrect, but the prefrontal cortex opened up our internal universe. In other words, once we have self-reference, we have directed imagination, we have a mechanism of morality that I won't talk about today. It's crucially important. The prefrontal cortex made us a new type of being, a new type of consciousness. This is, this is stunning. But it's absolutely true. I want you to see how it happened. Look at the next slide, please. If you, if you look up from the bottom, the, the third one up is Homo habilis, a primate um, of two million years ago, or more than that, actually. Look at that skull. The third one up, it has an eyebrow ridge, and the skull goes directly back from there. There is no forehead, none. It just goes directly back from the eyebrows. Now look at the top one, which is us. Look at that forehead. From the eyebrows, it goes straight up and makes a cavern of sorts in there that, that the other ones didn't have. That is precisely where this prefrontal cortex goes. That's, we are a different type of creature, a fundamentally different in, in consciousness. Now, I want you to look at that graph just to throw another point in here that's very interesting. And that graph shows the size of primate brains. And you see, you know, from seven, and then all of a sudden at two million years ago, it turns into the proverbial, and all of a sudden everything goes wild. There are theories that come and go, but none of them really have, have legs. None of them really stand up. We just don't know why that happened. But we, and that is humans got a prefrontal cortex that opened up our interior universe. Let's go to the next slide. Now I wanna, I wanna make this clear. This is where we're really getting into interesting stuff. The core model of prime had no foreheads. Their, the core model of their culture, how they interacted was the dominance hierarchy. You have the big apes slapping around the smaller apes, slapping around the female apes, slapping around the children, and so on. It was obviously more complicated than that, but you get the basic idea. This is also the model of human rulership. It's the same dominance hierarchy. Yes, in human, it's more complicated because we're different sort of beings. And there's a whole lot to say about this. I just started going over this in my talking about it more. I'm sure it'll end up as a book someday, but here. So this, these are the model of both. I've got a quote here from a, uh, a uh, primatologist from a, a well-known 
Oh, are we still connected? Uh, apparently, you guys can still see me. Um, I'm on chat. Let yes, me know if can. otherwise. Uh, you're actually quite good. Uh, so please continue. Great presentation. All right. So, and see. All right. I'm going to keep going. So this well-known non-human primates favored access to resources arises take larger shares by force or threat of force. We don't believe the model anymore. We've got the big foreheads. We've got the prefrontal cortex. We have the it's like I say, reputation, cooperation, all of our advanced abilities. It is the seat of post-primate functions. And that phrase to me is terribly important. We are post-primate. That's what we are. We're not the same as primates. Yeah, we share a whole lot of with them, and it's always very complicated and so on. We are suited to something better. Next slide. Our evolution is special. And I want to make this one last, last point before I start wrapping it up. I'm not going to read all of these quotes. It's faster than everybody else. Human is tied in with human culture. No one knows why. Um, but human culture is crucially evolution. Let's take two examples. In 10, 8,000 earth with very very few exceptions could digest cow's milk now in northern europe the vast majority 80 percent or more can and people of north european extraction all over the world can so they change and it's reflected in the dna you can find in the dna which we're very good at, at decoding you can find where there is this new section of dna that allows to build proteins that lead to the digestion of cow's milk. But it's even better than that. This sometimes is done over centuries, mere centuries. The Jews of Europe, because of the very particular circumstances that they were in for a number of centuries, adapted. And you can see it in the DNA. They got a 10% boost in their IQ because that's what it took for them to survive. And they got it, and you can see it in the DNA. That came with, with a price sometimes. The, the spatial acuity is not quite the same, and there are more genetic diseases of particular types. But this happened in mere centuries. So human culture is now affecting our evolution, making it insanely important. Now, one more. This is where two paths diverge for us. We have their high foreheads for a reason. We have a different method of operating. We are no longer designed to live according to a system of primates. We're, not, we're no longer designed for a dominance hierarchy in our private lives, in, in any healthy family. We don't operate that way. In any local community organization, here in the States, it's the Little League or in your area, football leagues. We don't operate that way. Um, we operate by a different level. And this is the way that the cypherpunks in the beginning operated. It was ad hoc uh, coordination. It was massive cooperation. It was a disbelief in, in central power. It was a belief in the efficacy of the human individual and systems that allowed that human to be effective rather to, than to be a one member of a dominance hierarchy that are given orders and told to obey or else. We're a different thing. And so we have the old model, which is the dominance hierarchy, which is never gonna change. It's never gonna get that much better. As long as there's power, it's always gonna be corruptible. It's always going to be the old dominance model and it's always gonna go bad. Question is only how fast. Our new totality, partial, incomplete, new as it may be, allows us to develop a new way. It allows us to use self-reference as a primary tool, to use the golden rule as a primary tool, to be hyper-cooperative 
it allows us to do all of the higher realm things, all of the new species sort of things. And it even, this is, this is one of the incredible things about Bitcoin, is that one of the human limitations is something called Dunbar's number. And it just means that humans have a hard time keeping 150 or 200 or more than that many people in their minds at the same time and considering them as individuals. It just seems to be a limitation of brain capacity, of, of mental capacity. Bitcoin transcends that. Bitcoin and all the currencies that are built on the Bitcoin model are methods of scaling trust. Bitcoin blows through Dunbar's net. We have, and it blows through, we can trust millions of people now and in a decentralized way. Oh my God, this is a big deal and it empowers this cypherpunk totality. So by living this new way, we are becoming better, not only individually, but genetically. This was why I say this is insanely great. And here we are, we're part of it. We've got the first pieces in place. We're using them every day. We're building them, we're expanding them every day. This is so much bigger than, than we thought it was. Um, to my mind, these are things we must do. We need it. The world at large needs it. And, and I, I'm convinced, and, and I hope that all of you feel likewise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. That, that, was, that was quite an interesting one of this. Um, I uh, would like to start off with, with one question before I ask the audience. And, and that is that you've showed that this recent progress has been exponential. Uh, and it seems that even, even more so in, in these times, it, it just kind of picks up on speed more and more and more. Uh, so, so the question is, um, like, how sustainable is, is that level of growth? Or, or do you foresee it to further continue expanding at an ever exponentially growing rate? The answer is that we don't know. Um, the, the Jews of Europe ex increased genetically, physically, biologically very quickly, um, but there were trade-offs, uh, probably much worth it, but there were trade-offs. So we really don't know how fast we can go and we don't really know how far we can go. Uh, we're in new territory, we're in a new realm. We know that we are picking up, no question, no question our, our speed of improvement has, has increased greatly and that we are becoming better. Uh, how far and how fast we can go, your guess is as good as mine. We just don't know. Hello, Paul. Do you hear me? Or yeah, I hear me. Uh, like the way I think about it, like we have uh, exponential development of all these different technologies, like genetics and robotics and AI and all these uh, things that can uh, potentially. Uh, destroy us uh, or like cause humanity to self-destruct uh, much easier uh, and the way I think about Bitcoin is like that's the basically the only hope for humanity that we get the sound monetary system so we get the right incentive system in place to do good instead of doing bad basically so do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, part of your question uh, blanked out on me, unfortunately, but I think I got the uh, Yeah, um, this is a tremendous hope for humanity. I wouldn't say it's the only one because there's always something else and there's always things that we don't expect that come along. Um, humans find a way. Uh, life finds a way. Um, but gosh, Bitcoin and, and, and having a different model of money, which means a different model of cooperation. Insanely important. You know, humans survive by cooperating with one another. 
That's how we survive. And to do that better, where it leads, but this is exactly what we've come into. We have a better model of doing it. And I think we need to run with it and make the most yeah. of it. Oh, um, the pirate party um, made an attempt in um, Europe and especially Germany uh, to um, popularize liquid democracy. Um, I, I think that you have uh, written a bit about, about it. Um, um, do you still think that um, there there is a, a bright future for a liquid democracy, um, or do you no longer believe that the um, political system can be be changed, um, the, the, the current political system? Well, the current political system will change. Uh, you know, everybody else with them. They they come on the stage. They pray. Uh, is um, a flawed mostly. However, if I could go back to, let's say, the way uh, we're in the United States, which I know very well, um, underneath uh, the Articles of Confederation or even underneath the U.S. Constitution in the very early days, my God, I'd go back in a second because it's so much less bad than what we have now. Um, but democracy by itself is an, an, an imperfect model. It may, however, and I say this, I mean it precisely this way, it may be considerably less bad than what we have now. It's never going to be the ultimate and future model, but if we could get, you know, a, a, a 1787 uh, American system, Yeah, I'd sign on to be, make things a hell of a lot better for a number of years. Any thoughts on liquid democracy? Um, I think you're, you're familiar, familiar with it. At all. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know. This, I don't know the system very well at all. And I, I really can't comment. Apologies. Hey, um, I have a question around um, people caring about crypto. So in the crypto and the Bitcoin community, most people have already bought what we're selling here in a way. And most of the world doesn't have that viewpoint. And if you ask them, you know, how they feel about their government, they wouldn't like it, but it wouldn't be enough of a reason to, uh, you know, start using Bitcoin or start uh, um, building a, a new system. So the question is, what would it, in your opinion, what would it take um, what needs to happen uh, that would cause the majority of people to actually care about these things and say, okay, I'm not going to use this fiat or I'm not going to, okay. uh, you know, uh, cooperate with the government. Uh, that's fine. Okay. What is required really is time. Um, things change more slowly than we'd like. Uh, and what we need to do is just to do our thing and to show people what we're doing, to show them that it's here, that it's not crazy people who do it, that there is a humane and benevolent outside. And they can dip their toe into it. They can take a look. They can go and come back and take another look and come back and slowly decide that maybe that outside isn't so bad after all, And then when things go in their life or in, or in the larger community, we're here and the system is ruining my business, but I can go over there and I can do business over there. I know my friend Bobby how to do it. I'm going to try that. And those are the kinds of changes that will really ultimately our realm and it's going to be slow we just have to keep doing what we're doing show your neighbors talk to people yes they're going to call you goofy for the first two or three times they run into it because they're defending their past actions they're defending their inertia they're you know defending their their mental comfort zone just keep at it just keep going talk to about it be benevolent And it, it will come come around. It will. I I know 
we none of us want it to take long but uh, uh, maybe to build upon that does. last question a bit more specifically you you have articulated in your writings that uh free marketplace right and an anonymous marketplace in multiple uh, scenarios and i think that well you've outlined the concepts of it quite well and we even have some implementation and some working code with something like open bazaar um though it still seems that the system is, is struggling and not really reaching a lot of adoption um other than aspect of time uh, do you have any specific um ideas why this is that this the usage of this technology is, is still lacking are there any meaningful steps on from our side missing sure. well uh, first of all again talk to your neighbors and friends you know tell them oh hey i bought this thing on open bazaar look it's really cool um those sorts of things are are, are always what we do but there are other pieces we can build um if we want a real functioning full full private economy we need things like anonymous drone delivery um and i've written a little bit about that uh it, to sketch the system out in some in it so I'd call, it's a series called uh, rise of the superfluous class uh, we need to do better with uh, exchanging um that will help a lot uh but and we just need to use our systems and to use them more and to just again friends and neighbors we're really good at building stuff we need to better share it yes really interesting uh, paul one final question before i let you go um because during your talk i kind of got one additional insight in why you potentially have named your company crypto hippie uh so so i did not know about that that uh, specific tight relationship between the hippies and the cypherpunks could you please elaborate a bit more on that and actually give some more concrete reasons on for that specific name sure uh, uh jonathan and i when um when we started it uh it was really important to him as much as me, um, maybe more, uh, that just for commercial reasons, that we have um, other to get. Um, you know, Crypto Hippie really is, is about keeping a door open out of the matrix to people who want it and very well. Um, and we wanted to have the idea of something more than just commerce nothing wrong with just commerce but we wanted to have that we have other ideas built in this this is a business to us but it's not just a business it's a mission and these seem to be a, a pretty good um a pretty good model for us and uh uh once upon a time i was a bit of a hippie do you still myself, have pictures so of the long hair uh, and big beard <laughs> I don't have any. Something may exist somewhere. I don't think I've burned them all. <laughs> well, let's see how good your OPSEC is. Let, let the hunt begin. <laughs> uh, Paul, this was a phenomenal uh, presentation. Thank you very much for hanging out. <laughs> So again, thank you very much for all the work that you do, all the writings, and of course, being influential in Parallel Polis, I believe without you, there would not be a Hackers Congress, and for sure not a seventh of it. Uh, so this was a phenomenal event. Uh, I believe this is the final presentation on the stage, um, meaning that this really is the, the last of the Hackers Congress, at least for here. Right now, there is already a uh, the, the closing speech on the main stage. Uh, and we will uh, move over there and finish it up strong. Uh, but again, thanks very much, Paul. Despite the, the troubles that the bureaucrats make you, uh, you still attended HCPP uh, in cyberspace, which is almost as good as a meat space. But looking forward to see you again next time in person.